Chapter Twenty Six of Plain Tales from the Hills. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Harris. Plain Tales from the Hills by Rudyard Kipling. Chapter Twenty Six The Rout of the White Hussars. It was not in the open fight we threw away the sword. But in the lonely watching, in the darkness by the ford, The waters lapped, the night wind blew, Full armed the fear was born and grew, And we were flying ere we knew From panic in the night. Bioni Barr Some people hold that an English cavalry regiment cannot run. This is a mistake. I have seen four hundred and thirty-seven sabres Flying over the face of the country in abject terror, have seen the best regiment that ever drew bridle wiped off the army list for the space of two hours. If you repeat this tale to the White Hussars, they will in all probability treat you severely. They are not proud of the incident. You may know the White Hussars by their side, which is greater than that of all the cavalry regiments on the roster. If this is not a sufficient mark, you may know them by their old brandy. It's been sixty years in the mess, and is worth going far to taste. Ask for the Maguire old brandy, and see that you get it. If the mess sergeant thinks that you are uneducated, and that the genuine article will be lost on you, he will treat you accordingly. He is a good man. But when you are at mess, you must never talk to your hosts about forced marches or long-distance rides. The mess are very sensitive, and if they think that you are laughing at them, we'll tell you so. As the White Hussars say, it was all the Colonel's fault. He was a new man, and he ought never to have taken the command. He said that the regiment was not smart enough. This to the White Hussars, who knew they could walk round any horse and through any guns and over any foot on the face of the earth. That insult was the first cause of offence. Then the Colonel cast the drum horse. The drum horse of the White Hussars. Perhaps you do not see what an unspeakable crime he had committed. I'll try to make it clear. The soul of the regiment lives in the drum-horse who carries the silver kettle-drums. He is nearly always a big piebald whaler. That's a point of honour, and a regiment will spend anything you please on a piebald. He is beyond the ordinary laws of casting. His work is very light, and he only manoeuvres at a foot-pace. Wherefore, so long as he can step out and look handsome, his well-being is assured. He knows more about the regiment than the adjutant, and could not make a mistake if he tried. The drum-horse of the White Hussars was only eighteen years old and perfectly equal to his duties. He had at least six years more work in him, and carried himself with all the pomp and dignity of a drum-major of the guards. The regiment had paid rupees twelve hundred for him. But the colonel said that he must go, and he was cast in due form and replaced by a washy bay beast as ugly as a mule, with a ewe-neck, rat-tail, and cow-hawks. The drummer detested that animal and the best of the band-horses put back their ears and showed the whites of their eyes at the very sight of him. They knew him for an upstart, and no gentleman. I fancied that the colonel's ideas of smartness extended to the band, and that he wanted to make it take part in the regular parade movements. A cavalry band is a sacred thing. It only turns out for commanding officers' parades, and the band master is one degree more important than the colonel. He's a high priest, and the keel row is his holy song. The keel row is the cavalry trot, and the man who has never heard that tune rising high and shrill above the rattle of the regiment going past the saluting base has something yet to hear and understand. When the colonel cast the drum-horse of the White Hussars there was nearly a mutiny. The officers were angry, the regiment were furious, and the bandsmen swore like troopers. The drum-horse was going to be put up to auction, public auction, to be bought perhaps by a Parsee and put into a cart. It was worse than exposing the inner life of the regiment to the whole world, or selling the mess-plate to a Jew, a black Jew. The colonel was a mean man and a bully. He knew what the regiment thought about his action, and when the troopers offered to buy the drum-horse, he said that their offer was mutinous and forbidden by the regulations. But one of the subalterns, Hogan Yale, an Irishman, bought the drum-horse for rupees 160 at the sale, and the colonel was wroth. Yale professed repentance. He was unnaturally submissive, and said that, 
as he had only made the purchase to save the horse from possible ill-treatment and starvation, he would now shoot him and end the business. This appeared to soothe the colonel, for he wanted the drum-horse disposed of. He felt that he had made a mistake and could not, of course, acknowledge it. Meantime the presence of the drum-horse was an annoyance to him. Yale took to himself a glass of the old brandy, three cheroots, and his friend Martin, and they all left the mess together. Yale and Martin conferred for two hours in Yale's quarters, but only the bull-terrier who keeps watch over Yale's boot-trees knows what they said. A horse, hooded and sheeted to his ears, left Yale's stables, and was taken very unwillingly into the civil lines. Yale's groom went with him. Two men broke into the regimental theatre and took several paint-pots and some large scenery brushes. Then night fell over the cantonments, and there was a noise as of a horse kicking his loose-box to pieces in Yale's stables. Yale had a big, old, white whaler trap-horse. The next day was a Thursday, and the men, hearing that Yale was going to shoot the drum-horse in the evening, determined to give the beast a regular regimental funeral, a finer one than they would have given the colonel had he died just then. They got a bullock-cart and some sacking, and mounds and mounds of roses, and the body, under sacking, was carried out to the place where the anthrax cases were cremated. Two-thirds of the regiment followed. There was no band, but they all sang the place where the old horse died as something respectful and appropriate to the occasion. When the corpse was dumped into the grave and the men began throwing down armfuls of roses to cover it, the farrier sergeant ripped out an oath and said aloud, "What? it ain't the drum-horse any more than it's me. The troop sergeant majors asked him whether he had left his head in the canteen. The farrier sergeant said that he knew the drum-horse's feet as well as he knew his own, but he was silenced when he saw the regimental number burnt in on the poor stiff upturned near four. Thus was the drum-horse of the White Hussars buried, the farrier sergeant grumbling. The sacking that covered the corpse was smeared in places with black paint, and the farrier sergeant drew attention to this fact. But the troop sergeant major of E Troop kicked him severely on the shin and told him that he was undoubtedly drunk. On the Monday following the burial, the colonel sought revenge on the White Hussars. Unfortunately, being at that time temporarily in command of the station, he ordered a brigade field day. He said that he wished to make the regiment sweat for their damned insolence, and he carried out his notion thoroughly. That Monday was one of the hardest days in the memory of the White Hussars. They were thrown against a skeleton enemy, and pushed forward, and withdrawn, and dismounted, and scientifically handled, in every possible fashion, over dusty country till they sweated profusely. Their only amusement came late in the day, when they fell upon the battery of horse artillery and chased it for two miles. This was a personal question, and most of the troopers had money on the event. The gunners saying openly that they had the legs of the White Hussars, they were wrong. The march past concluded the campaign, and when the regiment got back to their lines, the men were coated with dirt from spur to chin-strap. The White Hussars have one great and peculiar privilege. They won it at Fontenoy, I think. Many regiments possess special rights, such as wearing collars with undress uniform, or a bow of ribbon between the shoulders, or red and white roses in their helmets on certain days of the year. Some rights are connected with regimental saints, and some with regimental successes. All are valued highly, but none so highly as the right of the White Hussars to have the band playing when their horses are being watered in the lines. Only one tune is played, and that tune never varies. I don't know its real name, but the White Hussars call it Take Me to London Again. It sounds very pretty. The regiment would sooner be struck off the roster than forego their distinction. After the dismiss was sounded, the officers rode off home to prepare for stables, and the men filed into the lines, riding easy. That is to say, they opened their tight buttons, shifted their helmets, and began to joke or to swear as the human took them. The more careful slipping off and easing girths and curbs. A good trooper values his mount exactly as much as he values himself, and believes, or should believe, that the two together are irresistible where women or men, girls or guns, are concerned. Then the orderly officer gave the order, water, horses, and the regiment loafed off to the squadron troughs, which were in the rear of the stables, and between these and the barracks. There were four huge troughs, one for each squadron, arranged en echelon, so that the whole regiment could water in ten minutes if it liked, but it lingered for seventeen as a rule, while the band played. 
The band struck up as the squadrons filed off the troughs, and the men slipped their feet out of the stirrups and chaffed each other. The sun was just setting on a big, hot bed of red cloud, and the road to the civil lines seemed to run straight into the sun's eye. There was a little dot on the road. It grew and grew till it showed as a horse, with a sort of a gridiron thing on its back. The red cloud glared through the bars of the gridiron. Some of the troopers shaded their eyes with their hands and said, "'What the mischief is that there horse got on him?' In another minute they heard a neigh that every soul, horse and man, in the regiment knew and saw, heading straight toward the band, the dead drum-horse of the White Hussars. On his withers banged and bumped the kettle-drums draped in crape, and on his back, very stiff and soldierly, sat a bareheaded skeleton." The band stopped playing, and for a moment there was a hush. Then someone in E troop, men said it was the troop sergeant major, swung his horse round and yelled. No one can account exactly for what happened afterwards, but it seemed that at least one man in each troop set an example of panic, and the rest followed like sheep. The horses that had barely put their muzzles into the troughs reared and capered, but as soon as the band broke, which it did when the ghost of the drum horse was about a furlong distant, all hooves followed suit and the clatter of the stampede, quite different from the orderly throb and roar of a movement on parade, or the rough horseplay of watering in camp, made them only more terrified. They felt that the men on their backs were afraid of something, and when horses once know that, it's all over except the butchery. Troop after troop turned from the troughs and ran, anywhere and everywhere, like spilt quicksilver. It was a most extraordinary spectacle, for men and horses were in all stages of easiness, and the carbine buckets flopping against their sides urged the horses on. Men were shouting and cursing and trying to pull clear of the band which was being chased by the drum-horse, whose rider had fallen forward and seemed to be spurring for a wager. The colonel had gone over to the mess for a drink. Most of the officers were with him, and the subaltern of the day was preparing to go down to the lines and receive the watering reports from the troop sergeant majors. When Take Me to London again stopped after twenty bars, Everyone in the mess said, "'What on earth has happened?' A minute later they heard unmilitary noises and saw, far across the plain, the white hussars scattered and broken and flying. The colonel was speechless with rage, for he thought that the regiment had ridden against him, or was unanimously drunk. The band, a disorganized mob, tore past, and at its heels labored the drum-horse, the dead and buried drum-horse with the jolting, clattering skeleton. Hogan Yale whispered softly to Martin, "'No wire will stand that treatment.' And the band, which had doubled like a hare, came back again. But the rest of the regiment was gone, was rioting all over the province, for the dusk had shut in, and each man was howling to his neighbor that the drum-horse was on his flank. Troop horses are far too tenderly treated as a rule. They can, on emergencies, do a great deal, even with seventeen stone on their back as the troopers found out. How long this panic last I cannot say. I believe that when the moon rose the men saw they had nothing to fear, and by twos and threes and half-troops crept back into cantonments very much ashamed of themselves. Meanwhile the drum-horse, disgusted at his treatment by old friends, pulled up, wheeled round, and trotted up to the mess veranda steps for bread. No one liked to run, but no one cared to go forward till the colonel made a movement and laid hold of the skeleton's foot. The band had halted some distance away, and now came back slowly. The colonel called it, individually and collectively, every evil name that occurred to him at the time, for he had set his hand on the bosom of the drum-horse and found flesh and blood. Then he beat the kettle-drums with his clenched fist, and discovered that they were but made of silvered paper and bamboo. Next, still swearing, he tried to drag the skeleton out of the saddle, but found that it had been wired into the cantle. The sight of the colonel, with his arms round the skeleton's pelvis and his knee in the old drum-horse's stomach, was striking, not to say amusing. He worried the thing off in a minute or two, and threw it down on the ground, saying to the band, "'Here, you curs, that's what you're afraid of!' The skeleton did not look pretty in the twilight. The band sergeant seemed to recognize it, for he began to chuckle and choke. "'Shall I take it away, sir?' said the band sergeant. "'Yes,' said the colonel. "'Take it to hell and ride there yourselves.' The band sergeant saluted, hoisted the skeleton across his saddle-bow, 
and led off to the stables. Then the colonel began to make inquiries for the rest of the regiment, and the language he used was wonderful. He would disband the regiment, he would court-martial every soul in it, he would not command such a set of rabble, and so on, and so on, and so on. As the men dropped in, his language grew wilder, until at last it exceeded the utmost limits of free speech allowed even to a colonel of horse. Martin took Hogan Yale aside and suggested the compulsory retirement from the service as a necessity when all was discovered. Martin was the weaker man of the two. Hogan Yale put up his eyebrows and remarked, firstly, that he was the son of a lord, and secondly, that he was as innocent as the babe unborn of the theatrical resurrection of the drum-horse. "'My instructions,' said Yale, with a singularly sweet smile, were that the drum-horse should be sent back as impressively as possible. I ask you, am I responsible if a mule-headed friend sends him back, in such a manner as to disturb the peace of mind of a regiment of a Majesty's cavalry?' Martin said, "'You're a great man, and will in time become a general, but I'd give my chance of a troop to be safe out of this affair.' Providence saved Martin and Hogan Yale. The second-in-command led the colonel away to the little curtained alcove wherein the subalterns of the White Hussars were accustomed to play poker of nights, and there, after many oaths on the colonel's part, they talked together in low tones. I fancy that the second-in-command must have represented the scare as the work of some trooper whom it would be hopeless to detect, and I know that he dealt upon the sin and the shame of making a public laughing-stock of the scare. "'They will call us,' said the second-in-command, who had really a fine imagination. "'They will call us the fly-by-nights. They will call us the ghost-hunters. They will nickname us from one end of the army list to the other. All the explanations in the world won't make outsiders understand that the officers were away when the panic began. For the honour of the regiment, and for your own sake, keep this thing quiet.' The colonel was so exhausted with anger that soothing him down was not so difficult as might be imagined. He was made to see, gently and by degrees, that it was obviously impossible to court-martial the whole regiment, and equally impossible to proceed against any subaltern who, in his belief, had any concern in the hoax. "'But the beast's alive! He's never been shot at all!' shouted the colonel. "'It's flat, flagrant disobedience! I've known a man broken for less damned sight less!' They're mocking me, I tell you, Mutman, they're mocking me. Once more the second-in-command set himself to soothe the colonel, and wrestled with him for half an hour. At the end of that time the regimental sergeant-major reported himself. The situation was rather novel, tell to him, but he was not a man to be put out by circumstances. He saluted and said, Regiment all come back, sir. Then, to propitiate the colonel, And none of the horses any the worse, sir. The colonel only snorted and answered, "'You'd better tuck the men into their cots, then, and see that they don't wake up and cry in the night.' The sergeant withdrew. His little stroke of humour pleased the colonel, and further, he felt slightly ashamed of the language he'd been using. The second-in-command worried him again, and the two sat talking far into the night. Next day but one there was a commanding officer's parade, and the colonel harangued the white hussars vigorously. The pith of his speech was that, since the drum-horse in his old age had proved himself capable of cutting up the whole regiment, he should return to his post of pride at the head of the band. But the regiment were a set of ruffians with bad consciences. The white hussars shouted and threw everything movable about them into the air, and when the parade was over they cheered the colonel till they couldn't speak. No cheers were put up for Lieutenant Hogan Yale, who smiled very sweetly in the background. Said the second-in-command to the colonel unofficially, these little things ensure popularity, and do not the least affect discipline. "'But I went back on my word,' said the colonel. "'Never mind,' said the second-in-command. "'The white hussars will follow you anywhere from to-day. Regiments are just like women. They'll do anything for trinketry.' A week later Hogan Yale received an extraordinary letter from someone who signed himself, "'Secretary Charity and Zeal, 3709 E.C.' and asked for the return of our skeleton, which we have reason to believe is in your possession. "'Who the deuce is this lunatic who trades in bones?' said Hogan Yale. Oh, "'Beg your pardon, sir,' said the band sergeant, but, "'but the skeleton's with me, and I'll return it if you'll pay the carriage into the civil lines. Oh, there's a, a coffin with it, sir.' Hogan Yale smiled and handed two rupees to the band sergeant, saying, 
Write the date on the skull, will you? If you doubt this story and know where to go, you can see the date on the skeleton. But don't mention the matter to the White Hussars. I happen to know something about it, because I prepared the drum-horse for his resurrection. He did not take kindly to the skeleton at all. End of chapter 26 The Rout of the White Hussars Recording by Mike Harris